at the same time, I've been doing quite a bit of historical research and study because I'm currently teaching a course on Christian identity and Orthodox Presbyterian history at our church. I'm developing that for a, a Presbytery event coming up this weekend. And I hope to parlay all of that into a course that we could put into Reformed Academy. It's a little bit more specific, OPC, but it, it has application for, I think, conservative evangelicals of all kinds because that Presbyterian modernist fundamentalist controversy uh, touches upon all different stripes of, of conservatives in the early 20th century. So there's application there. But as you know, Jim, uh, and as many of our listeners may know, uh, there's a great conflict. This all came to a head with the founding of the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions uh, in 1933, and Dre Machen and others eventually being brought up on trial for their involvement in that. And there are many things that, that started leading up to that point in time. But that's the, you know, so there's a lot of background context and a lot of opinions about Machen and his, his people uh, prior to that ever happening with the founding of Westminster, the reorganization, you know, which, which was precipitated by the reorganization of the board of Princeton Seminary, but backing up even to 1922 when Fosdick preached, shall the fundamentalists win, and then all of the things that happened as a result of that. It became necessary. Now, I'm not at all equating what happened to the independent board to what Reform Forum does, but I'm making a point that, that hopefully will land in a second. But it became necessary because of modernism within the church boards and the church's agencies. Um, not just there, but in Christian ed and all sorts of things. Uh, that it, it was necessary because the, the foreign missions board of the Presbyterian Church was not engaging in faithful, proper missions. They, they were espousing a lowest common denominator approach where you would you know, work alongside of Muslims and Buddhists and others, and they were not willing uh, to take a stand for Jesus Christ being the one name given under heaven by which men may be saved and to operate appropriately. Uh, they were employing missionaries like Pearl Buck, and others who thought a lot of these things, such as original sin, were superstitions and shouldn't be taught to the people of the lands where they were serving. So, barring any possibility of reform, they tried to reform it. They pointed this out. But barring the possibility of making any change, it became necessary for faithfulness to Scripture, <clears throat> for Machen and others to begin engaging in Presbyterian foreign missions through an independent board. It was never viewed as an official agency of the church. It wasn't necessarily viewed as some sort of substitute in the sense of an ecclesiastical substitute. It was viewed as a necessary measure to, out of their own conscience to be able to support and engage in missions the way the Bible taught. And they made every effort to try to, to make a case for this, both theologically as well as ecclesiastically and according to the polity of the Presbyterian Church, specifically with the Westminster Standards, which spoke about the Lord being the Lord of the conscience, about assemblies having the possibility of erring, you name it. There's all sorts of writing on this by Murray Force Thompson, J. Gresson Machen, who wrote a 110-page pamphlet, or, and uh, other people, I think H. McAllister Griffiths. There were a lot of people involved in this who were writing on this particular issue. And in those documents <clears throat> are just nuggets, gold nuggets of how to understand properly a parachurch. And I think they just nailed it. And I think that we have always tried to conceptualize and think of Reform Forum's relationship to the church analogous to the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. There is a difference. <clears throat> um, we don't view that the church is is engaged in false teaching or modernism or or these sorts of things. Nevertheless, we are seeking to do things that are a little bit more specific, to do things that are perhaps outside the general purview of what the church ought to be doing. It wouldn't be wrong for the church to be filming video courses. I've talked to several people and tried to get them to do this and try to help them with it. But you know, these are supporting activities that can be helpful to the church. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't go around saying a Christian publisher shouldn't exist. Would anyone say that? Or would, would anyone say that 
the Great Commission specifically says that we must be printing books. No, no, not at all. The church has given the Great Commission. Now, there's some latitude in the way that we achieve that and accomplish that. But the church, and the church specifically, the body of Christ, and I'm talking about the kingdom of God, the visible church, with its officers, they've been entitled with and trusted with the Great Commission. You know, we haven't as individuals. But Jim, you and I can certainly come together as Christians, come to an agreement of a particular doctrinal beliefs and convictions that we have, and voluntarily associate and appeal to other people who might also be interested to join together our efforts as individuals to seek to advance uh, that mission and vision to support the church so that she would be better equipped to accomplish the work of the Great Commission. Nobody would deny the validity of Crossway in printing Bibles. You know, some people might not like the way they do it. I, I love it. But that's a necessary, important activity. But it's a parachurch right? That's how we view ourselves. That's how the independent board viewed themselves. And in fact, they made the same arguments that Christianity Today and Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing, that's what they were named at the time, were, were necessary. And no one had a problem with Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing in 1933 and four and five. But for some reason, you know, you got to depose Machen because of the independent board of foreign missions even though there were many other independent boards out there doing all sorts of missionary activities in other lands and in other denominations. No one had a problem with them. The problem was that they criticized the official board for being modernists and people were withholding their money from the main board and giving it to the independent board. And that's the unforgivable sin. Yeah, yeah, early. That's where it gets. <laughs> that's where it gets personal. personal when, the, when the money trail uh, starts uh, <laughs> fading off, and and the stream gets cut off, and now there's no money to support the denominational right. board, and now people get really upset. Yeah, that's what happened to John DeWard. He wasn't on the board, of independent board, but becoming convinced of modernism being present there, and in and in uh, education because some of the curriculum that the church was teaching to children, you know, advocated for Jesus being just a man and not, not also fully divine. Yeah. So DeWard uh, and his church, they withheld funds. They just wouldn't send what, you know, basically what, what, what equated with a tax. The denomination said, these are voluntary gifts, need to be free will offerings. They're not a tax. But then in like two paragraphs later, they would say, and you absolutely must give them. Huh. And they equ- And they equated... Uh, the, I'm not exaggerating this. They said that uh, effectively to to not support the official board of foreign missions is the same thing, essentially the same thing as being a member of the church and refusing to take the Lord's Supper. 